and the way in which science has used then law to suppress its rival in this case arises out of a profound discomfort on the part of science about this future state of complexification that is clearly the uh, grail, the dwell point, the end point of the human historical process. No one of us, I think, can imagine that history could go on for another thousand years. I mean, what would it look like at the current rate of population growth, spread of epidemic disease, rate of invention, connectivity, depletion of resources, the atmosphere? It is impossible to conceive of another thousand years of human history. History, then, is ending. History is a kind of gestation process. It's a kind of metamorphosis. It's an episode in the life of a species. If you think of the, the simple example of metamorphosis, that of caterpillar to butterfly, we all know that there is this intermediate resting stage where the caterpillar is, for all practical purposes, enzymatically dissolved and then reconstituted as an entirely different kind of organism with different uh, physical structures, different eyes, different legs, a different way of breathing, with wings where no wings were before, with a different kind of feeding apparatus. This is what's happening to us. History is a process of metamorphosis. It's a pupation stage. It begins with naked monkeys and it ends with a human-machine, planet-girdling interface capable of releasing the energies that light the stars. And it lasts about 15 or 20,000 years, and during that period, the entire process hangs in the balance. It's a period of high risk. It's like uh, what a butterfly is doing in a cocoon or what is happening to a child in the womb. It's a gestation process where one form of life is being changed into another. Well, this would all happen naturally and with a great deal of anxiety, I imagine, as history builds to its ever more climactic and horrifying crescendo, and we would all be ignorant or very baffled about what's going on, were it not for the institution of psychedelic shamanism. Remember I said that what is dissolved are the, the crystalline structures of cultural assumption? Well, one of the strongest um, symmetries in our cultural crystal is the symmetry that gathers around the concept of past and future. The shaman actually rises into a domain where past and future are different areas on the same topological manifold. This is not a metaphor. It's what's really going on. If you think about shamanism in its classical guise for a moment, it is about um, predicting weather, predicting game movement, and curing disease. If you had a prescient or extraordinary understanding of the future, each one of us would be able to do these things. Predicting the weather, you just look into next week and there it is. Predicting the movement of games, same deal. Curing the sick actually involves very judicious choice of your patients with a pre-knowledge of who will get well and who will not get well. So it's as though the members of the culture are imprisoned in linear time and the shaman is not. And why not? Because the shaman has perturbed the uh, brain states sanctioned by the culture, sanctioned by its educational processes, its habits, its uh, attitudes. And into that vacuum 
created by the perturbation of these cultural values, rushes the raw, unanalyzed datum of reality. This is what Aldous Huxley called removing the reducing valve of consciousness. And suddenly, culture is seen to be a relative phenomena. The stockbroker, no different from the rainforest shaman, each somewhat similar to uh, the Trobrian Islander or the Eskimo. Culture is simply clothing upon the human experience, but the human organism outside the confines of culture in a direct relationship to nature transcends time and space. This was a fact, I believe, that was known in prehistory and, in fact, was the source of Paleolithic values which were not material, not linear, not surplus-oriented, not class-oriented, not power-oriented, but rather oriented toward a kind of egalitarian partnership in, a, in an environment of great material simplicity. And human beings lived like that for probably a half a million years with poetry, with dance, with mathematics, with magic, with story, with humor, but not with the paralyzing and toxic artifacts of the late evolving machine worshipping monotheistic linear phonetic alphabet tight ass straight culture that we are a part of. So now, at a kind of moment of great cultural challenge and dynamic for Western civilization, which has for a thousand years called all the shots and shoved itself down everybody's throat, whether they liked it or not, in the last hundred years, through the science of anthropology and ethnography and ethnomedicine and botany, the news has arrived that these quote-unquote primitive people are in fact master technicians of journeying into a world of the neurological imagination, a world we didn't even know exists, a world that is as distant to us as the world at the heart of the atom is from the rainforest fishermen. And because our own cultural values seem a little shoddy at this moment, those on the fringes of Western civilization have begun to seek alternatives, begun to look at uh, alternative religions, yoga, tantra, Buddhism, Zen, whatever, uh, alternative approaches to diet, vegetarianism, macrobiotics, so forth and so on, and alternative approaches to authentic experience, which means psychedelics. Uh, in the early stage of psychedelic involvement, everyone was sort of flying under the banner of uh, hands-on Freudianism or hands-on Jungianism. You know, we're going to see those archetypes. We're going to confront those sexual repressions. We're going to journey into those traumatic childhood memories. N now, it's understood, I think, that those metaphors were fairly inadequate and that actually we stand on the brink of an unexplored landscape of planetary size. The world of the High Paleolithic, which is a Gaian world, a world of feeling, not analytical intellectual constructs, but a world of empowered feeling, empathy, and intuitive understanding, an understanding that doesn't arise in a context of Greek logic, but in a context of animal knowing in the authentic mode of the body. So, just to bring it all around here, the great exhibit which we must always keep in front of ourselves and our critics is the mystery of the human mind and body. No one knows how it is that I can command my hand to make a fist and that it will do that. <laughs>